to you, and uh, good to see you this morning. We'll get there in a minute. Nothing. Is it on the back? Hope so. I'll just talk loud enough you can hear me. All right, so good to see you this morning, and it looks like winter has uh, come back to visit us. It's not technically Blackberry winter. That's in what? April? May? May? May. All right. But we're, not, we're, we're hoping we don't have that. Amen. Okay. Because uh, you know this cold weather, what it does, at least for me, it messes the fishing up. Man, that's what it does. And we don't want that, right? Amen. Anyway. But so good to see you this morning. So glad you're here. And let's stand. There we are. Let's stand all around. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I've got to turn it on. It's okay. But uh, all right. Well, let's stand all around and ask God's blessing upon our time together. And uh, so glad that you are here. And we've got a great, great treat. We're going to have a kids' choir this morning. going to sing a special for us. And uh, before, I, before I preach the message this morning, glad they're going to do that. Excited for them. They're excited too. But uh, let's pray together and ask God's blessing upon our time. All right? Our Father, we thank you for your kindness, for your goodness. We thank you for another day of life. And we don't want a day to go by without thanking you for that. You are the giver of life, and we don't want to take it for granted. Lord, I pray as we come together this, this morning and gather together, that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I pray that you get great honor and glory from, from our worship, because Lord, you're worthy. And so as we sing, may it not just be songs, not to be words that we read and say, but may it be true worship from the heart. And as we look to the word of God, would you help us to understand it and apply it to our life, that we may, we may grow in grace and in knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, I pray. As the psalmist said, open thou mine eyes, and may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Help the choir to sing, as it set the tone for, for the service, and may everything be done and said bring great glory to you. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing together. Take your hymn books this morning, that blue book in front of you there, and let's go to hymn 63, all right? Hymn 63, praise him, praise him. He's worthy of our praise. Let's sing it out. Hymn 63. All right, let's lift our voice together. 63, let's sing it out. It's great to choir this morning. Praise him.
page on your, in your hymn books there. Let's just sing this chorus together, can we? His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Think about these words. Well, he is the great shepherd, rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. We're here this morning to worship the Lord and lift his name high. Let's sing this great chorus. Most of you probably don't even the words, but it's on that page 65 in your hymn book there, number 65. Let's sing it out this morning together. He, his name is wonderful. Let's sing it together. His name. seated. Pray for the choir as they sing this morning. For the grace of God, thankful for it all. And we wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for that. We wouldn't have the opportunity to love the Lord if he didn't first love us. I'm very thankful for the love of God this morning. I appreciate you guys up in the sound booth. Got it working, doing a great job. You don't get enough credit, just so you all know that. All the guys that help us with that, and we have a, kind of have a rotation going with all of that. But I just want to say thank you from the pulpit to all those working with video and audio. Uh, we need you, all right? So, so I appreciate your help that way, doing a great job. And I probably shouldn't tap like that. That's probably disrespectful, and I apologize, all right? But uh, you're doing a great job, okay? Just want you guys to know that. All right, a couple announcements I want to bring to your attention uh, this morning. We had a great uh, missions conference, and I appreciate all the missionaries that came and speakers that came and the messages that were preached. Very challenging to me, and I know many of you as well. And appreciate your, your interest in missions and giving to that uh, through this local church of Bowling Springs, all right? And we've got to take on some more missionaries and be on the lookout for a quick meeting with that one evening. We'll do that in the evening, Sunday evening. 
and uh, so be on the lookout for that as we'll make announcement uh, about about doing that. We don't really have a a format necessarily in our constitution or like that as far as taking on missionaries, but I do have some good ones in mind. Now, just so you know, when we have missionaries in, uh, these missionaries and their families, uh, they come this way. Now, you can imagine. As pastor, we get emails and phone calls at the church and even personally of several missionaries throughout the month and even the weeks at times. Uh, but the ones that we try to have in is not just some random uh, individual. The ones we try to have in, what I like at least, is recommended to us. So I'll, I'll call pastors and other ministry leaders that, that, I, would, that I would consider very um, reputable and people that I can trust, right? And I'll say, hey, look, what missionary would you recommend to come to Bowling Springs? And so just know that, all right? We try to do our best as far as taking recommendations. Uh, we, we try our best to do some, some vetting, that type of thing, as far as they believe like us. Uh, they have the right philosophy of missions and that kind of thing. So we do a very... Try to do a very diligent job with that before we even ever have them in, okay? So please know that. And, uh, but the missionaries, we have some in mind we'd like to take on. We'll talk about, about those in the next couple, couple of weeks. We'll have a meeting to, to bring them on, all right? And excited how God's going to use us as a church to further the gospel around the world. But we can't do it without you, all right? So I encourage you, as I did last Sunday, to get one of these Faith Promise cards. They're out there in the lobby. And uh, I hope you've taken one already, and you've taken it, and you're praying of what God have you to do. Uh, if you remember, as Mary anointed the body of Jesus with the spikener, to remember that story, uh, with the spikener, it was very costly. Uh, the Gospel of Mark said it this way, she had done what she could. That's what Jesus said. She did what she could. And that's all Jesus wants from us, to do what we can. What you can do, some of you, it may just be a dollar a week is what you can do. Others, more. But just do what you can, all right? Let's do our very best and diligent best to, to give this way to missions, and I encourage you to do that. So take one of these Faith Promise cards, and on the one half, the small half that you can tear off, uh, take that and mark what you can do. You don't have to put your name on. It's not a collection agency, all right? Everybody say amen right there, okay? That's not what this is. Uh, but do what you can, and mark what you can do. Don't put your name on it, but put this little piece, this little piece of, of, of the card in an offering plate. And it helps us as a church know how we can move forward when it comes to the area of missions. Now, you have been, may have been given the missions for 100 years. That's fine, and the same amount for 100 years. That's fine, but just please mark that so we know what all is potentially coming in so we know how to potentially move forward, okay? It's just a tool to help us, again, go forward with the gospel, for the glory of God. That's kind of the philosophy around here, going for the gospel, for the glory of God. All right, help us that way, and that would be great. Well, a couple of announcements to be reminded of. Ministry night next Sunday evening. Looking forward to that. It's always a great time. Men's breakfast is April 1st, and no, that is not April Fool's joke. We are going to have breakfast, and uh, also with that, we're going to do a kind of a cleanup outside. We'll do some mulch, put some mulch around, mulch down in the... Um, playground area and around other areas as well and do some cleanup outside so fellas if you can help us with that that'll be great maybe we'll try to do some uh, uh some some seating and that kind of thing as well on the grassy areas but keep that in mind ladies night april the third the first monday of every month is ladies night as well as the men's breakfast for saturday of every month at 8 a.m ladies night 6 p.m extravaganza right around the corner as well saturday april the 8th and we're looking forward to that and there's a sign-up sheet, not, not to come, but a sign-up sheet for helping us with bringing stuff, candy, uh, cupcakes, cookies, chips, uh, buns, that kind of thing, because we're going to have barbecue uh, as well that day. And Brother Shannon, good to see you, my friend. Glad you're here. And you try to slip in incognito. Ain't happening, all right? Everybody's seeing you, and they're definitely going to see you now. But, uh, but Shannon does a great job with this, and he's going to cook barbecue for us again, and maybe we can try to throw some ribs in there as well, all right? But looking forward to it, April the 8th. But if you can help us bring anything, please sign up. And that'll be great, especially with the individually packaged candy as we stuff about, I think about 3,000 eggs. We'll stuff those and have an egg hunt across the way. I do that because it's all in the field, very open uh, over here across the road here. But it's still a great time. But we'll need help stuffing those eggs. And we'll try to do that the Friday uh, evening before, all right, on the 7th. And so keep that in mind. We'll talk more about it as we get a little bit closer. But, uh, but anyway, keep some of these things in mind. A couple of announcements we'll come, come back to here shortly. 
and, uh, and that would be good. But one more thing I need to do is this. We have some men who can make their way to the front, all right, of the auditorium, then turn right back around and go to the back of the auditorium. But if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, we're glad you're here. I hope you make yourself right at home. If you don't mind, as a first-time guest, please slip up your hands. These fellas can see it, and they want to get in your, your hand a visitor card. And if you don't mind, to fill that out on both sides. It helps us have a record of your visit. And on the other half of that card, you'll find some information about our church. If we can ever help you in any way, you please, please let us know, all right? And that will be great. That will be great. Well, let's all stand all around, okay, as folks are filling some of these cards out. Let's, the rest of us stand, and let's sing again together. And let's take our hymn books and go to hymn 82. Hymn 82, blessed be the name. Let's sing it out, hymn 82. All right, let's lift our voice, continue and worship the Lord this morning. Number 82, let's sing it out together. All praise to make ourselves friendly and all the kids are going to sing in just a few minutes so we're not going to dismiss our kids church at this time so they'll stay right here for just a moment you greet those around you and we'll come back and sing that last verse in just a moment
make our way back to our seat this morning. As we do, let's sing through that last verse and chorus. Hymn 82, blessed be the name. Sing it out, here we go. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of If you don't mind to come on down and take up our morning offering. And Kenny's on his way, gonna make a couple announcements about some activities up and coming. And then Kenny's gonna lead us in prayer. All right. So come on, Kenny, make those announcements. Just a couple announcements here this morning, and uh, thankful for the Lord's presence here today. Looking forward to the service here this morning. A couple things coming up uh, next Saturday. This last opportunity we have to announce it. Next Saturday we're going to uh, the trampoline park in Greenville, and you can sign up for that. And if you have not signed up, uh, probably do that next couple days, or today, or, or Wednesday by the latest. And we'll have to finalize our numbers. And, and then if you're planning on going, we need you to sign a waiver. That is a digital waiver. And so if you're signed up, I'll send you a text in the next couple days uh, to fill that out. And that goes right back to them so we don't see that. Cost is $15 for that. And to just have to have a waiver to go. And if you want to go with us and not jump, that's quite all right. Maybe if you've been injured in the past or uh, don't want to go, and just want to go and watch, no, no names will be mentioned. But if you want to go and just watch, you are more than welcome to do that, and uh, that'll be a good time. Carowinds is our next activity. Beyond that, after uh, April, we have extravaganza, and a big activity in April is, besides that, is Carowinds. That's April 22nd. The cost is only $30 per person for that. Really a great deal for that, and it's uh, off, kind of off-season right now. going to be a beautiful day, hopefully, and uh, $30 a person. That's for any ages, young, old. We've got a ton of rides and a great time. Uh, that's $30. Just sign up for that so we know a definite number of tickets ahead of time. And uh, that's going to be all day. We'll leave here at 8 and probably return by 8 that night. Anybody can go. And if you want to go enjoy that, it's going to be a great time. And the last thing I'll say is camp uh, is getting ready to slow, close down here in the next few weeks. And so if you are still in the lim uh, limbo about that going and you're in, going into fourth grade or just graduated, you are uh, still uh, open to go. And we'd love to have you go with us and just get a registration in. Even if you're still thinking about it, just get it in because that will close down very soon, okay? I'll be around back if you have any questions at the end of service today and happy to help and answer questions. Let's go, Lord, and pray for this offering. Lord, we love you and thank you for this day given to us and thank you for the opportunity to uh, gather to worship today. We pray you'll speak to our hearts through your word and uh, Lord, just give us exactly what we need of today. We pray you'll bless and use this offering. Uh, Lord, take it and use it as you would see fit. Lord, help us to be uh, diligent in our, our giving and, and doing what you want us to do. And even, Lord, in our, our missions giving as well, thank you for the challenges this week and from your word. And, uh, Lord, just help us to continue to be faithful to what you've given us to do. And uh, bless and use this time. We ask all these things in your name we pray. Amen.
Our kids choir is uh, going to sing for us this morning. We had them kind of on the schedule for last Sunday, but as things kind of progressed and whatnot, just kind of ran out a little bit of time. So I said, look, you guys are on for next week. And so I know they're excited to sing, and I'm excited to hear them. And I'm actually going to come down here too so I can see all the uh, fun and uh, listen to them. It's going to be great, all right? So you pray for them now as they sing, okay? That's fantastic. Great job, y'all. So proud of you. Did a great job. I know your mom and daddy's grandpa, grandma's all excited for you and proud of you. Keep up the good work, all right? And we'll have you back up here very soon. And so at this time, the kids go across the way. Maybe the kids that weren't able to sing go across the way to the children's church, and that'll be great, all right? Just cross the side there, side doors, into the chapel building, and we'll be praying for the kids as well as the workers as they teach them and have uh, some preaching to them and that kind of thing. Excited for them, all right?
Well, for us, let's take our Bibles this morning. Let's go to Jonah chapter 4, all right? Jonah chapter 4, as we continue in our study of this little book of the Bible. And as you're finding your place there this morning, just want to remind you once again, all right, as we try to do with all the books we go through, kind of give a, a contextual overview, if you will, of these um, books of the Bible we go through. Uh, but just keep in mind, all right, when you find your, as you find your place, when it comes to Jonah, the book of Jonah, most people are familiar with Jonah and the whale, but we know by now, hopefully you know by now, this book is more than just that. It's more than just a story about a man and a great fish. No, it has much more to learn. We have much more to learn from this little book of, of the Bible. And the greatest thing we can learn from this book of the Bible, as well as all of Scripture, is that we learn about our great God. We learn about our great God and His mercy and His kindness and His care, His tenderness, His love, His grace, His compassion, His forgiveness, His wisdom, His foresight, yes, even His stern correction to stubborn servants. Say that ten times fast. But we learn more about our great God than we do about just a great fish. There's more to learn about the Lord. And I hope by now you're learning something about God from this little book of the Bible and understanding it's more than just about a story of a Jonah and the whale. But as we come to Jonah, we know thus far that Jonah was given a command from the Lord and that was what, church? That was to go, go to Nineveh and preach to that city. Preach unto them the preaching that God bidded Jonah. That's what he was to do. And he was simply to obey this clear command from the word of God of God, from God himself, but for one reason or another, we know that Jonah disobeyed God's clear command for his life. He rebelled against God's clear uh, will for his life. But listen, in the midst of our rebellion, we know God does not just allow us to continue there, at least, and be happy about it, all right? Uh, sometimes the most miserable person on earth is a believer who's out of fellowship and out of God's will. I guarantee you that's the most miserable person on earth. You may be happy for about a month, but I tell you, down the road is going to come some miserableness in your life. It will, because you're out of fellowship with God. And no doubt that was true in the life of Jonah. Because God does not allow us just to stay in our rebellion. No, He begins to deal with us. He will begin to correct us. And we know he will correct us in love and for a purpose because God still had a purpose for the life of Jonah. He still wanted him to go to Nineveh. So God dealt with his rebellion. And though it took some doing and chastising this stubborn servant, we finally see that Jonah turned to the Lord. We finally see in chapter 2 that he cried unto the Lord, began to pray. He did this finally, repented, got right with God. After he repented and got right with the Lord, Jonah received a recommission, if you will, from the Lord to go back to Nineveh. And so Jonah, armed with a recommission from the Lord, armed with fresh mercy and forgiveness from his great God, Jonah marches into the city of Nineveh and begins to preach to the people, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Salvation is of the Lord. And listen, as Jonah obeyed and as Jonah preached the message something amazing happened. An evangelistic campaign like none other, where an entire city, thousands of people, turned to the Lord, and I dare say revival, true, true revival, broke out in Nineveh. And the whole city turned to God. Amazing. It still stirs me as I think about it. Because I love to see that here. But multitudes of people turning to the Lord. And as you come to chapter 4, you might think that John would be on cloud 9 after that meeting. After that preaching, you think he'd be full of joy and praising the Lord, but we quickly found out as we came to chapter 4, we did not find a joyful Jonah. We did not find a pleased prophet. Rather, we discovered a man who was very angry, exceeding angry, a man who was full of wrath and rage against Nineveh, and yes, I believe even a little against God, if not a lot against God. But be reminded once more, if we allow anger, to control us, we will soon find ourselves doing some foolish things and saying some very silly things just as Jonah, as Jonah did. So we came to chapter 4 where we found out we find a resentful Jonah. But there's more in this scripture. There's more in this chapter. And we need to see what God has for us today. All right, so let's go back to it. Jonah chapter 4 and discover what happens next. All right. 
So Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, 2, and uh, uh, 3 and 4, we find out that Jonah is displeased, exceedingly angry, and begins to tell God why he's angry. But the Lord turns to him, we saw last time, and just simply gives him a question, a very convicting one, one of rebuke. In verse number 4, the Lord said, Doest thou well to be angry? Let's start in verse number 5 for our text this morning. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would come of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd, but God prepared a worm. A worm. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd, that it withered. And it came to pass, when the sun did rise, that God prepared a vehement east wind. That's a violent, that's what that word means, vehement. It means a violent east wind. <clears throat> and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted, and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither, neither madest it to grow, which came up in a night, and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? Our fathers, we read the scriptures, I pray that it be a deep seed in our hearts from which fruit that remains will spring up and last. Help us, I pray, to apply the Word of God to our very lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we read this, I understand there's a lot going on in the, the rest of this chapter, but let me try to paint a, a contextual picture here, all right? Uh, after Jonah was presented with the question in verse 4, Doest thou well to be angry? Understand Jonah stormed out of the city and completely ignored that question the Lord had just asked him. Uh, there was no, yes, Lord, you are absolutely right. My anger is unfounded. You don't see that. You, you don't see him saying, I don't have a good reason to be angry. There was no, Lord, I'm sorry about this. You're right. I am wrong. Please forgive me of my anger. You don't see that after verse 4. You don't see that. You don't see any repentance, no apology, not even a grunt from Jonah. What we simply see is this, Jonah simply walked out on God. He completely ignored the Lord. Now, I don't know about you this morning, but being ignored is not my favorite thing in the world. Anybody here love being ignored? Good. I'm glad I'm not the only one, all right? I don't think any of us love being ignored, especially ignored by those that would be uh, under you as far as uh, maybe in your house. Kids, let's use that, all right? Um, do you love it when your children ignore you? It does something for your soul, right? But not in a good way. <laughs> when you say, look, I need to go clean your room. Yeah, okay. And what do they do? Not clean their room. I need to go do this. Waiting for a response. Here, no response. Five seconds later. I asked you to do something. Would you please do that? No response. It does something for your soul on the inside, right? It ain't a good thing. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, amen. All the parents raise their hands. Okay, anyway. But we don't like to be ignored. But this is what Jonah did. Jonah ignored God. And I'd say if we were God, aren't you glad we're not God? Amen. But I'd say if we were God in this moment, probably one of us would put a whooping on Jonah, squash him like a bug, just for the downright disrespect that he had. But listen, we don't see that. We don't see that response from God. And by the way, I'm glad for that. I'm glad. Because if you're like me, there's been times in my life where God did a work in my heart, convicted me about something, and I didn't respond. Shorter terms, I just simply ignored God. Now, I dare say you've done the same. As God, maybe through the preaching of the Word of God, or as you study in the Bible, and God speak to your heart about a specific 
a specific thing in your life and you felt the conviction. You know God was pressing upon your heart and yet you did nothing. That's what it is to ignore God. We've all been there, I'm sure. And John was there at this moment, but instead of squashing this fella like a bug, instead of dealing with him harshly, we see this, we see this, we see God dealing with him kindly. We see that God's continued goodness to Jonah. We see this, number one. Here's what I want to see this morning. We see the continued tenderness toward Jonah. Now you say, preacher, where do you see the continued tenderness to Jonah? Well, besides the point that Jonah is still walking and breathing, all right, I want you to see this. Look at verse number five. So Jonah went out of the city, sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would come, become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah and, and that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad, exceeding glad of the gourd. So listen, as Jonah walked out of the city, Jonah found him a comfortable spot to sit, maybe on a hillside somewhere, in order to be able to physically see the city, to see if the Lord would actually spare these wicked people, which he hated, or maybe God will change his mind again and destroy this city. That was probably the deep-seated root of hope that Jonah had in his heart, to destroy this people. But he wanted to see what happened. So he found him a place that he could overlook the city, and the Bible says here Jonah made him a booth. Now, what is that? Well, a booth here is not like a booth you would go and sit in at a restaurant, all right, that you're thinking of already. You're not paying a lick of attention to, to the message. You're thinking of, of that booth you're going to sit in at the Mexican restaurant or Olive Garden or whatever. Well, put pause on that and try to focus in on the message, all right, or on the Word of God. But it's not that kind of booth. It's not a booth that you would sit at at a bus stop. That's not what we're talking about, all right? A booth here that he had made would be something like this. It'd be like a little uh, tent type of construction. It would, be, it would be constructed of branches with leaves that would be intertwined in order to block out the hot Middle Eastern sun. So that's what John is doing. With this booth, he is making himself some, some shade. He would sit under this booth in the shade to try to keep him a little cooler. Now, it's nothing like sitting under a nice shade tree in the hot part of summer. Now, winter's upon us. We don't know what that's like just yet. But, you know, in the summertime, think that way, all right? Uh, but there's nothing like sitting under the shade tree and just getting a little relief from that hot sun. How I many you know what I'm talking about? But that's what he's doing. He's trying to get a little relief from the hot sun because he's going to sit there for the next 40 days and see what's going to happen. So that's the context of all this, to see what become of the city because he's still within that 40 days. So as Jonah sits there under that booth, guess what God does for him? <laughs> It's amazing to see. It really is. You see, God sees what he's doing. God sees him sitting on the hillside. God sees the sun beating down upon his head. God sees that little booth, that little tent-like structure he has constructed to get out of, the, out of the hot sun. And God knows the sun's beating upon him, of course. And so God does this. Look at verse 6. It's just so tender. I'm telling you, it is so tender to me to see what God does for him. Verse 6. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah, and made it that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the cord. This is amazing to me. Knowing what Jonah's doing, putting on a pout and temper tantrum show, and yet God in his goodness and his kindness and his tenderness still takes time to take care of Jonah. It's absolutely amazing to me that God would minister to Jonah in his, as he says, his grief. It's amazing to see. It's amazing. Look, the Lord looked at Jonah and said, Jonah, I, that sun is pretty hot. I know because I put it there. Hey, Jonah, that booth that you made, that's nice and all, but you know, it's, really not, it's not good enough for you. It could be better. You need something more. Jonah, you need a little more shade. So, John, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to make this gourd to grow, that it may put a shadow over your head to help you a little bit more in your grief. This shows the tenderness that God still had 
to Jonah, even when Jonah had a temper toward the Lord. What's the Bible say? That Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Now this is kind of complete opposite of what was going on just moments before in verse number 1. When he was exceedingly angry, but here's what Jonah was. He was happy when the Lord took care of him, but mad when he took care of his enemies. He was, he was happy when it came to his comfort, but mad when the Lord wanted to comfort others. But the God who showed great mercy upon the Ninevites... And in turning from his wrath that they deserve, showing them mercy, listen, he, he showed just as much mercy upon Jonah in this moment. Listen, the tenderness of God is so real and it's so evident, and Jonah should have seen that. I'm just trying to tell you again how merciful our God is. Again, remember this little book of the Bible, it's not as much about Jonah and the whales as it's about Jehovah and his ways. And one of his ways is this, he's merciful God. Even those that don't deserve it, including Jonah, he is so merciful and tender and caring. God is merciful. That's just who he is, and his mercy is not contingent on who we are. Matthew 5, 44, I'm sorry, Matthew 5, 45. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God is just good. He is just merciful. That's just who he is, and he showed this to Jonah yet again. And listen, this mercy... This kindness, this tenderness, this goodness of God should have caused Jonah to do this. Romans 2, 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Listen, this tenderness, this goodness of the Lord shown to Jonah should have led Jonah back to the Lord. It should have led him back in that fellowship with God. It should have caused him to fall upon his face. It should have pointed him to the Lord of mercy, to the Lord of grace, and to God's care and patience and forgiveness and generosity and so much more. It should have pointed his focus off of himself and onto the God who loved him the most. This one simple good act of God should have got his eyes back on God. Why? Because the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. That's why. It should have, yet sadly, listen, sadly, his heart, so full of anger and so full of rage, it remained hardened to the tenderness and goodness of God. That's what anger and bitterness will do. Now, I'm not preaching on that this Sunday. Now, we'll get more to that next Sunday. You've been warned, but please show up anyway, all right, as we finish out Jonah next Sunday, but... But his anger, listen, it hardened him so much to God that even his kind act of God wouldn't resonate with him. So many times we as believers can find ourselves in that same place that we miss out on the goodness of God because we're so focused in on ourselves and so selfish and so inward instead of looking upward to God. Can I help you this morning? Get your eyes off of self. You may be going through something very hard. I get it. I understand that. But even in that moment, can you turn your eyes upon the God who loves you the most and see His kindness and His tenderness and His goodness to you and allow that to draw you closer to Him? Because, listen, we don't deserve it. None of us deserve the blessing, the goodness, the kindness, the tenderness of God. We couldn't do anything to earn that. Just as Jonah didn't do anything to earn it here in our text. He didn't do anything to earn the gourd that would cover his head, that would minister to his grief. God just simply did that because, well, he loved Jonah and took care of him. So please know in this moment the tenderness of God to him. Yet, as he allowed his heart to continue to be hardened, we see this, number two. Not only do we see the tenderness of God to Jonah, but we want to see this, the Lord's continued teaching to Jonah. <laughs> I tell you what, old Jonah, he is like many of us. He didn't learn the first time. If you're like me, well, sometimes, well, I didn't learn the first 50, 11 times. Anybody know what that means? All right, good southern phraseology there. It means a lot, okay, if you don't know what 50, 11 is. <laughs> but uh, many times we don't learn the first time or the second time or the third time or the 50, 11th time, but it takes a lot of, a lot of teaching on, on our part. You, you see, for, for us here, for us here, 
Uh, we see that Jonah knew, in his mind at least, we looked at scripture, he knew in his mind the, the God's will for his life. He knew that. He got that commission back before he left to go to Tarshish and then eventually back to Nineveh, of course. He knew God's will in his mind. He knew God's word in his mind. He knew what God wanted from him in his mind. But in his heart, he refused to kneel. He refused to bend the knee. He refused to humble himself. He refused to accept what God was teaching him and telling him. It kind of reminds me of the story of a little boy who got in trouble. Little boy got in trouble with his mama, and uh, after he got in trouble with his mama, his, his mom said, Now listen, little Johnny, I want you to go sit over in that corner and you be still and quiet. And don't you move a muscle. Anybody, parents, ever said that to you? Yes, I had that often. Sit in that corner, don't you move a muscle, don't you make a peep. I want to hear nothing out of you. Sit there and be still. And so reluctantly, little Johnny went over the corner and said, I'll sit here and be still and I'll be quiet, but just know, mama, on the inside, I'm standing up. That's Jonah here, all right? And many times that's us too. And it's a heart matter. It's a heart matter. Because in his heart, he refused to learn the lesson. With his body, yes, he went. His mind, sure, he went, but internally. He didn't want to see Nineveh saved. He didn't want to see Nineveh turned to God. He didn't want to kneel to the cause of the Lord. So with that being the case... <clears throat> Our gracious and patient God was going to continue to teach Jonah. And I'm thankful he lovingly does the same for us. But if you remember back in chapter 1, as we begin to look at that, we saw that four times in this book of Jonah, we see this phrase, the Lord prepared. Now, we know as we came to chapter, uh, into chapter 1 that the Lord prepared a great what? A great... All right, seven of you listened, that's good. A great fish in chapter 1. We know God prepared that. And of course, he was using that fish to, to teach Jonah, to draw Jonah back to himself, to get Jonah to uh, do the will of God and go to Nineveh. But the three other times we find that phrase, the Lord prepared, we find it in this chapter. We find it in chapter number 4. We find it where the Lord prepared a gourd in verse, in verse number 6. And then we find, and God prepared a worm in verse number 7. And then in verse number 8, we find, and God prepared a vehement east wind, a violent east <clears throat> wind. But in each of these preparations, the Lord was trying to do something. He was trying to teach a lesson to Jonah. Now, now from this gourd, there are several lessons we can look at. For time's sake, we'll just, just quickly, let me, let me look over these. Uh, but, but from the gourd, we can see the lesson he was trying to teach him is, again, God's continued care. And we've already talked about that as the Lord would meet his need. But also, he would teach Jonah this. He would teach Jonah that even with the gourd and with the worm and with the wind, listen, God, your God, Jonah, is your creator. He is creator. You see, when the Lord prepared the great fish, the Bible says the Lord had prepared that means he had done this ahead of time. That means God had taken time to, to prepare this fish, let this fish to grow, and be able to come at a certain size that the, a human being would sustain life inside of the fish. So it took time, right? But the preparation of the gourd, the Bible says God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah. There was no long process here. It was more of an instant, instantly creating the gourd just for Jonah for this very Moment. So listen, this gourd instantly sprung up. And understand something as you read the book of Genesis in the first few chapters. Only God can make something instantly spring up. How did he create the world? With his... Three of you got it. Oh, okay. Everybody say words on, on the count of three. One, two, three. Create it with his word. word. All right, good. He spoke it into existence. He said light. There was light. He said water, there was water. He said dogs, there was dogs. He said cats, mm. he said cats, all right, but anyway. But listen, what I'm saying is he created with his word, spoke it into existence instantly. Listen, only our creator can do that. And look, look here in this moment, he did the same. He made it instantly spring up, made it instantly come up for this moment just for Jonah. And he should have learned the lesson, listen, John, God's not just any God. This is creator God, Elohim. And he's the only one that can do this. 
He should have been reminded of this fact. The very one he is serving is the creator God. And since he is the creator, he's only worthy and deserving of his creation. And by the way, not just Jonah. As you see later on, he is worthy and deserving of, yes, even the people of Nineveh. Why? It's his creation. He created us in his own image. It's his creation. He's deserving of his creation. He's trying to teach Jonah this. Not only do we see he's teaching about his care and that he's the creator, but he's teaching him this as well, that he is in control. God is in control. Who was it that made the worm in verse number 7 to eat the gourd? Someone tell me. It starts with a G. Yeah, God, that's right. It was God that, that was in control that created that worm to eat the gourd. Again, who was it that prepared the violent east wind to, and the sun to beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted? In verse number 8, it was God. That's right. And all these preparations, the Lord is trying to get Jonah to understand something very important that do all of us well to understand, and that is this. Jonah, God is in control. And that's not just a quaint saying when we say that in times we don't understand, no, no it's an it's a absolute truth to live by. God rules and he overrules. He's in control. God is in control. Jonah, you need to learn this lesson. But surely Jonah knew that. Jonah knew this. I mean, obviously, he was a prophet. He knew God was in control. He went through a storm in chapter 1. He knew God was in control of that storm because it ceased immediately when they threw Jonah overboard. They knew God, he knew God was in, in control. He knew this. But he wasn't learning it. He wasn't applying it. Look, our God is so gracious that if we fail the test the first time, guess what? He'll let you retake the test. <laughs> now, that don't mean the test gets any easier. So I would encourage you to learn it the first time. So you don't have to go through, through it the 50, 11th time. All right. Learn what God is trying to teach us. And no doubt Jonah, during his life as a prophet, no doubt he himself was considered by many as a teacher. He would have taught the Old Testament scriptures. He would have taught the word of God. He would have taught others about God. Yet here we see Jonah learning more about the Lord himself. All from this gold.